Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to another edition of the BNA to Virtual Event Space. We are joined, as you know, Mondays, 3 p.m., <laughs> Sony photographer Mahesh Stapa. Mahesh, what's going on? Welcome back. Nothing much. Glad to be back. Uh, it's still cold and rainy and dreary in Seattle. It's still a great time to be indoors and given webinars. So I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know what else to expect out of Seattle. I mean, that's just kind of, it's par for the course. So the, the good news is, is not much has changed. And that's the bad awesome. news is, is not much has changed. So <laughs> hopefully you're joining us here today and you're in the right place. Mahesh is going to be talking about filters, filters. So uh, we were talking about this a little bit in the green room and uh, all the effects of them and the different price ranges and things like that. So Mahesh will be hitting on all those things, the how, why, and when to use them. So if you have any questions related to filters or even just landscape photography in general, that's kind of what we've been talking about for the last three weeks with Mahesh. Feel free if you missed it, get it in now. We'll go ahead, we'll get them over to him. We'll get them answered. If you're joining us on Zoom, use the Q&A tab. If you're joining us here on Facebook or Vimeo, you can use the comment section. But otherwise, without further ado, I want to say thank you very much to Mahesh and Sony for sponsoring this event. And I will pass over the reins to you, Mahesh, so you can talk about some filters today. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for joining me again, wherever you are. Hopefully, you're having a great day. It's a Monday. I have the day off, so I'm enjoying it. And uh, really, I would, wouldn't be anywhere else because I love talking about this stuff. I love shooting, talking about it, editing, printing, what have you. So any questions you may have that comes up, please ask in the chat or the QA section. Uh, and these guys will get it to me um, and, uh, and we'll move from there. So this is part three of the talk. If you missed part one was uh, APS-C cameras and lenses, uh, what I think are the best uh, in that genre. Uh, part two was the settings that I typically recommend for getting the most out of your landscape imaging. And finally, this one is filters, uh, optical filters. Now, not filters that you apply in uh, Photoshop or, uh, or or apps, but actual physical filters you put in front of your glass to get the effect that you want uh, during the shooting process, uh, during in-location stuff. So, I'm going to show this pretty much as a PowerPoint type of presentation, maybe interspersed with some talking head, but let's see how it goes. So this is my talk, and I have a couple of disclosures I always like to make. Uh, I am a Sony Alpha Collective member. This talk is being sponsored by Sony, uh, but they haven't looked at the talk beforehand. Uh, I haven't got any specific approval about it. So what I say really is my own opinion and what I really feel is going to be most helpful for people looking at purchasing filters, using filters and such. Uh, all the images were taken with the Sony camera and lens and uh, I'll be discussing several types of filters, round filters, square filters, uh, ND filters, so on and so forth. And I'll be presenting several brands. There's no specific brand that I'm uh, going to recommend. There are a lot of good brands out there uh, and I'll talk to you about maybe a few of them that are that are great. Uh, so let's just go from there. If you miss anything that I'm saying or you want sort of a written summary of what I'm talking about, maybe you learn better by reading about it, uh, you can go at your own pace. I have made the sort of, sort of summary article or blog on my website. I just put it up this, uh, this morning. If you have a chance, go ahead and visit it. If you have questions, also you can reach me through my website, or you can you can ask me questions here. But go there, you'll see the first very first article will be this thing that, that's called landscape photography, my guide to using filters. Again, these are my opinions, um, but they are founded in in lots of experience. So ND filters. Let's start with that, uh, and because I think everything sort of flows from ND, whether you're talking about graduated, uh, circular, a square, horizontal, what have you. So let's just talk about ND filters in general. Uh, it's basically sunglasses for your lens. You know, when it's very bright outside, you put a pair of sunglasses on and things aren't so bright anymore. And that's what an ND filter does. And the, the neutral part of ND filter means that it, theoretically it's colorless. So this is where some of the differences in cheap filters versus uh, really good filters come in. The really good filters, and typically those are the expensive ones, unfortunately, are, are very color neutral. So what that means is once you put these strong filters on, 
the, there's no color shift. There's no cooling down. There's no warming up. There's no funky tints like green and purple and so on and so forth. It's a nice, simple, gray piece, piece of glass in front of your camera. And you're just going to have the effects of the prolonged exposure as opposed to any changes in color. So that's what an MD filter really is. So it's, it's a dark piece of glass, basically. Now, these filters come in various strengths, and they are measured in terms of stops. Uh, each numerical increase in stop is it inhibits 50% of light from coming in. So from no filter to one stop means that 50% of the light is uh, being excluded from hitting the sensor. Two stop means 50% more than one stop or twice as much as no filters. So just as a concrete example, example, if you had no filters whatsoever and you're looking at a uh, scene and you take a picture or you look at the parameters of what a proper exposure should be, and it comes up with a one second exposure. Right now, you put a one stop filter <clears throat> that should theoretically increase your exposure time to two seconds to get the same amount of brightness in your image. So the brightness doesn't change. Your overall uh, highlight and shadow exposure doesn't change. You just achieve the same exposure with a prolonged period of time. And so two stops means four seconds of exposure, three stops means eight seconds, so on and so forth. And I just want to show you this one little thing as I am, uh, as I remember this. There are square filters and there are round filters. Round filters, if you have an ND filter, for example, let me just give you an example here. If you have a round filter, it just simply screws on to the front of your lens. If you have a square filter, it has to go in front in a holder. And if you look at the image that I'm showing you, this is a ND filter that's square, but you notice it has a little foam around it, right? These, these round ones don't have any foam on it. That's because these round filters, that's one advantage of the round filters. It'll go flush up against your lens. There'll be no air gap that you have to worry about or any kind of light leaking, very, very minimal light leaking, if any, if you have a good quality circular ND filter. However, if you have one of these square ND filters that has to go in a holder, uh, it'll often come with this foam backing, and you need that to stop any light leak from coming in. Even with that, some of the, again, the poor quality or the less expensive ND filters, uh, it won't do such a good job of stopping that light leak from hitting your, uh, your camera or sensor. And the longer your exposure time, uh, the more you're going to see the effect of light leaking. And that's, that's why I sort of want to point that out to you with the little foam at the back of these square filters. So when are we going to use these uh, ND filters? One is what we just talked about. We want to prolong the exposure time. For example, here's an image. And you know, it doesn't, people think, oh, ND filter, you're going to have a, a darker image. So if you're done properly, it's, you're not getting a darker image. You're getting the same brightness overall of the images. You're just prolonging the time to achieve that brightness so you can have this smoothing out effect or this, um, or this uh, prolonged time effect, if you will. So for example, in an image like this, uh, you look at the, uh, the clouds in the sky. So this was taken on a bright day with a relatively strong ND filter. This was probably a 10 stop ND filter. And so to achieve the same brightness as no filter at all, uh, the prolonged exposure time ended up being maybe 30 or 60 seconds. And that was enough time to get this motion in the clouds. Uh, and the closer you are to the overhead part, the more motion it's going to achieve. For example, there's really not much motion or, uh, appreciable at the very distant aspect of the clouds. But the closer you come to the camera lens, the overhead clouds, the more the motion becomes obvious because there's more perceptible motion uh, closer to the lens. Uh, it smooths out the water surface. You know, there are ripples on the water that, that get averaged out as the prolonged time happens. And then you have um, averaging out of all the ripples and it's nice and smooth effect. Again, you may not like this effect, but if you want this type of effect, this is really the only way uh, with optical filters that you can achieve this. There are some ways to manipulate it digitally with um, digital filters or computational photography, but that means a lot more time in front of a camera, I'm sorry, in front of a uh, digital darkroom and uh, mixing together images problems with misregistration, there are other hassles. So if you want to achieve it 
in camera, optical filters really is the only way to do something like this. Another great use of it is outside of landscape photography is to achieve this shallow depth of field in portraits while still being able to shoot in a very bright environment. So let's talk about a scenario where you have no filter on the lens and you wanna shoot your lens at f1.2 or f1.4, but it's very bright outside. And you've lowest, lowered your ISO as much as you can, ISO 100, and you have increased your shutter speed to the maximum that your camera allows. So maybe one four thousandth of a second, one eight thousandth of a second. You look at the back of the camera and the exposure for those two values, you know, a very wide aperture, very, very fast maximum shutter speed and lowest ISO, it still looks too bright. It still looks way blown up because there's so much brightness from the sun or what have you that you cannot achieve the effect that you want and still get the proper exposure. That's where an ND filter comes in. You screw on a three-stop ND filter or two-stop or what have you, and then you, and then you inhibit all that light from coming in so you can maintain that shallow depth of field with a very wide aperture. So that's a great example of where you can use depth of field uh, to help you, ND filters to help you with depth of field outside of landscape photography. Now, people also love to do solar photography or solar eclipse photography. This is the last time the solar eclipse happened uh, a few years ago. And this is where you want very, very strong ND filters, uh, at least a 16 stop, you know, sometimes even a 24 stop ND filter. That means it's so dark that if you held it up to the light in your room light, you could not see through it. It would continue to be opaque and black. But because you're looking directly at the sun, uh, you want a very, very strong ND filter. Now, there are some caveats here, right? Some safety issues with this. Whenever you do any solar photography or eclipse photography, you wanna make sure that you are using live view or you are using an electronic viewfinder. You do not wanna be looking at that through an optical viewfinder. Uh, here's the reason. It's not that your eyes are gonna burn out uh, you know, from, from all that brightness. It's because these lenses, they even the ND filters, they, they may inhibit light, uh, visible light from coming through, but it doesn't really inhibit infrared light or, uh, or other uh, UV light uh, from hitting your eyes. So you really want to make sure that you're using an electronic viewfinder uh, or, or a live view kind of uh, situation when, you, when you're doing solar photography. Now, the ND filter also is necessary if you do live view, but you wanna put the ND filter on before you turn on live view. Otherwise, uh, a high magnification lens that's using a 400 millimeter lens, most of your field of view is gonna be that sun or whatever, it's gonna burn out your sensor. It's gonna burn your sensor. So you wanna have the ND filter in place before you turn on that live view. And it's, again, very, very strong ND filters, 15, 24 stop. You may have to stack filters. You know, you may have to take a 10 stop ND filter and a six stop ND filter, stack them to give you a 16 stop ND filter to do solar photography, but it's it's wonderful for that kind of stuff if you want, if you like doing it. Let's talk a little bit about the different types of filters. We have round filters, we have square filters, uh, or quadri quadrilateral filters. I say quadrilateral because some of them are square, some of them are rectangular, and you have the drop-in filters. And I have several examples of each over here. I'm gonna just start again with the circular filters. And this is what they are. Again, as you can imagine, they just screw on to the front of your lens. Now, you may have lenses that are various sizes. You may have 82 millimeter thread uh, lens, 77 millimeter lens, uh, 72, 67, what have you. I recommend getting a filter diameter that fits your largest diameter lens and then getting step up or step down rings to fit onto your other lenses. Here's why. Each one of these filters, the really good kind can be very, very expensive, you know, upwards of a few hundred dollars even for a single filter, almost the price of a lens. And if you have smaller lenses, there's no reason why you should buy a complete set of filters for each lens. Just buy the highest diameter ones and get step up or step down rings like this. This is a step up ring. Uh, sorry, I'm going to like this so you can actually see this, focus on this. Uh, and, and this will allow you to attach the filter 
onto a smaller lens. And you can get several of these very, very cheaply. So that's circular. The downside of circular filters is there really are no great graduated or reverse graduated ND filters that are available for this because you have to be able to move those filters. And we'll get to that when we get to the uh, different, uh, different variations of ND filters. But the benefit of this is that no light leak whatsoever. Even the best square filters I found that given enough time, the back of the foam will wear away, you know, it'll, 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 it'll peel off and you won't maintain that level of light leak protection that a circular filter gives you. So if all you want to do is just use ND filters to prolong exposure time, uh, to increase, uh, to, to, to keep your shallow depth of field for, for portraits, then I think circular polarizers or circular filters in general are the way to go. And people say, well, what if I want to use a circular polarizer and an ND filter? You know, I'm going to have to stack filters. I know that the more you stack, the lower the quality of the images. That's true, but they make, but they make ND filters now with a polarizer built in, which I think is brilliant. For example, I, I carry one of these. This is an ND3, but it has a polarizer built into it. You see this? It actually is turning as I am as I am uh, putting ND. So you can have the effect of the polarizer and the ND on a single filter. So you don't have to worry about stacking. So that's another really good benefit for circular polarizers. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the square filters or the part of language filters. The real benefit of these filters is being able to use graduated or uh, reverse graduated intravisor filters. So for example, here, is a, well, let me show you this one first, which is a little less complicated. So I'm gonna put it right in front of the lens so you can see the difference. So this is what's called a soft graduated intensity filter. If you notice that at the very top, it's darkest. And as you go lower, it gets gradually more and more clear until it's completely clear at the bottom. So that's great for when you wanna take pictures uh, we have a bright sky and a dark foreground, sort of like in the late afternoon light or the early morning light uh, where the sun is just above the horizon, or a little higher than the horizon, uh, but the foreground is completely dark. So if you try to expose for the sky, for example, without a filter, your foreground is going to become completely dark. But if you try to expose for the foreground, then your sky, which is much brighter, is going to be blown out. That's where a graduated ND filter is really helpful. Now, you may want to use what's called a reverse graduated neutral density filter. And some people don't really know what this is. Uh, some people think that it's just a neutral density filter or a graduated neutral density filter that's turned upside down. And that's not what it is. It's basically a filter that's again, uh, dark about one third of the way down and it gets less dark as you go up, but doesn't become completely clear. It's still dark at the very top, but not completely clear. But as you go down, it does become completely clear, right? You see that? And that's used when you have the very brightest part of your scene around the horizon. When it's around, when sun is just about to set, for example, it's brightest at the horizon. So you put the darkest part of the glass right in that area. And then the sky is still bright, but not quite as bright as the horizon. So it gets darker, so it gets, it gets less dark as you go up, but it doesn't become completely clear, but it's clear in the foreground, you know, for example, if you have some flowers or, or mountains that, it, that may not be, uh, that may not be uh, in brightness, that's gonna show through because that part is clear. So when you have the sun sort of at the horizon or just above the horizon, the reverse grad and the filter has a much better effect than if you have uh, a grad ND filter. That grad ND filter is going to be much better if you the brightness higher up in the sky. That's the part you want to be darkest. Now I'm going to show you some examples as we go through. And finally, we've got these drop-in filters. There are a couple of types of drop-in filters. Now you've got these very big 500, 600, 800 millimeter lenses that if you looked at the very front element, it'd be huge. It'd be a big thing, round thing like this. It's very impractical to try to screw on 
an ND filter or, or, or put on adapters for grad ND filter for something that big. Wouldn't it be great if we could put filters at the back of that lens where it's tiny near the lens mount? And that's what these filters are. Some of these filters just drop in to the very back of the, uh, uh, of the lens. There's a little slot you can put it in there. Others, you actually have to screw out part of the lens. And that's what I want to show you. For example, here is my Sony 14 millimeter f1.4 that I use for astrophotography. This is, this is my, uh, one of my favorite lenses. And if you look back here, I have taken out the original uh, plastic cover and put in this, this filter adapter. In this filter adapter go these tiny little filters. And let me show you what they look like. They look like something like this. These tiny little ND filters. And these things, basically fit into the back over here. And then there's a little, little lever right here, right there, that'll keep it in place. So there are those types of ND filters also. Unfortunately, for those types, uh, there really isn't a polarizer because you, you have to be able to physically turn the polarizer to have that effect. And you can't do that with the back of the lens. But those are also ND filters that you can use for these big bulbous front element lenses. Now, you know, they may, they do make some, some companies do make adapters, but there are no real filter threads here, right? So you couldn't put round circular filters on this. You could possibly put uh, big adapters and those square filters, but it's a lot more elegant, I think, just to use uh, the filter that goes to the back. So you're not carrying some, some huge uh, adapter and lens system around just for this lens. So that's really, that's really great. So those are the various types. You've got the circular, you've got the quadrilateral, and you've got the drop-in type. Let's talk about variable ND filters for just a second. People ask, should I buy variable ND filters? Personally, I think they're okay for videography type of work, you know, because oftentimes the light is changing. You want to maintain uh, a certain shutter speed based on uh, what the, uh, sorry, you want to, uh, based on what the uh, the resolution you're using, how many frames per second you're using. If you're shooting 24 frames per second, you want to have a shutter speed of 1 50th of a second, basically twice, uh, twice that. Uh, so in order for you to maintain that shutter speed or shutter speed priority, as the light is changing, wouldn't it be nice to have a ND filter that you can just adjust on the fly to, to achieve that same level of of shutter speed and a variable ND filter for that is great, okay? Now, I don't like it so much for landscape photography because I often find that I'm doing long exposures and doing long exposures and at the more extreme values of these variable ND, like let's say ND filters, strength of three stop to 10 stop, you get down to the nine, eight, 10 stops, you start getting these artifacts, these patchy areas of brightness and darkness, some cross type artifacts, which I don't really like, and which is basically unavoidable for me, no matter what I pay for the filter. A variable ND filter, you know, whether it's a $400 filter or a $50 filter or a $25 filter, those artifacts, at least for me, have always persisted. And that's just physics. You know, basically a variable ND filter is basically two polarizers that they put on top, next to each other, on top of each other. And as you turn, you're turning two polarizers uh, together to achieve that maximum darkness, if you will. But if you know anything about polarizers, it basically inhibits light from entering at certain angles. It's not like, it's not a uniformly uh, decreasing value of light coming in. It's actually inhibiting certain angles. So when those two angles from those two polarizers uh, are matched or unmatched, you can get these patchy areas of brightness and darkness that I just don't like. Now, if you don't go to the extreme edge of these ND filters, let's say you only go to four stops or three stops, then you minimize that effect, but you still see a little bit of it. So I say, unless you're doing video, I would avoid the variable ND filters uh, for a landscape photography. So we talked about the graduated ND filter already. One of the things that I really want to point out is, again, I want to emphasize that this effect is only available on the square or quadr quadrilateral. You can't really get this on the circular uh, uh, filters because 
you need to be able to adjust where that level of the horizon is depending on your composition. One last thing I wanna mention is that they come in various strengths as far as the um, abruptness of the transition between the very dark areas and the very bright areas. There's a soft, a medium, and a hard. Soft means that that transition from the very dark area to the very bright area is very gradual. Like for example, this is a soft red ND filter because there really is no appreciable change uh, where I can say, oh, it's become all of a sudden black and all of a sudden clear. It's very soft. And there are other filters like this one where the transition is super abrupt, right? And that's closer to the hard grad ND filter. And where somewhere in between is the medium uh, grad ND filter. The reverse grad ND filter works the same way. It also comes in the soft, medium, and hard variety. And again, this is what it looks like as you see the as you see the PowerPoint presentation. It's dark about a third to the half of the way down, and it gets less dark as you go to the top but clear as you go to the bottom. Now, this is the hard variation because there's a relatively abrupt transition between the very darkest and the very clearest area. And I wanna show you a little bit about how I use these filters. I'm gonna play this video where I uh, took a pre-stop reverse grad ND filter uh, to one of my favorite places in Seattle, uh, and I took a shot. So here, here, watch this video and see what happens to the back of the screen as I adjust the placement of this filter. And you notice how the sky is being tamed a lot more. I can see that detail in the sky a lot more. So here's something that people often confuse about grad ND filters or reverse grad ND filters. They expect the exposure to be perfect. They expect that all of a sudden the image that you get is what's on the right-hand side. No, all you're doing with this grad ND filter is taming it enough, but taming the sky enough to even out the exposure between the sky and the foreground. Some people expect the sky to be like completely dark, get all these rich colors. That's not what you want. If you, if you, if you could achieve that, if you, if you used a strong enough grad ND filter to have that effect in the sky, it's also gonna have a lot of effect on the things that are poking up into the sky like trees and buildings and such. So you'd have a transition where the sky would look beautiful, dark, but all of a sudden this, these buildings that reach up into the sky would also be very, very dark, an abrupt transition between dark and light. And this looks very unnatural. You wanna use a filter so you're just barely evening out the amount of exposure between the sky and the foreground. And then you need to go back in post-processing and get, get it to look the way you want it to look. So, this is the same image on the right that I took into Photoshop where I adjust some of the highlights, uh, some of the contrast, the dark points, you know, as opposed to having to blend images, which I would have to do, was I using, by not using optical filters. This is a single exposure, but further refined to taste, if you will, after you've achieved some degree of parity between the sky and the foreground. You can notice that there's actually a little artifact here over here. So that's sometimes unavoidable. Remember, when you use these filters, there's, you have adapters and there's actually a gap between the front element of your lens and the filter. And sometimes little artifacts and glare can happen. So I had to go uh, and remove this uh, manually in Photoshop. One option you could do, which I, I don't show, show you here, but you can actually take your hand and put it like this on the outside of the, of the frame, you'll get the hand in your picture, but because you've sort of changed that angle of light that's hitting the, uh, the filter, uh, you'll get rid of this glare, in which case you'll have to blend the image that you took with your hand uh, one, with one that you didn't to get rid of some of this glare. But one thing I really want you to realize is that the ND filter or grad ND filter, it's not a panacea, it's not a cure-all. It's still another tool and you have to use it the right way, but you still have to do some manipulation after the fact. Okay. And right, let's talk a little bit about polarizers. I think polarizers are great. It has its use. 
I really like to use it for waterfalls uh, and images where I don't have a lot of sky in my field of view because it does a great job of removing glare, right? There are certain filters for which you have no options. You cannot simulate the effect of a polarizer with any software because you know you can't get rid of angles of incidence of lights post process. It has to be done in camera, so you can't simulate a polarizer effect. You can't you can't increase the micro contrast and look below the surface of the water that allow that, that the polarizer allows you to do in post processing. However, if you're using ultra wide angle lenses, you can have this sort of weird effect on the sky. You see how this part of the sky is a lot darker than this part of the sky or that part of the sky, uh, where this is a lot a darker blue versus uh, sort of a more uh, a lighter shade of blue, baby blue over here. That is the artifact. Some people actually like this artifact and they, and they use it. But personally, I don't like this gradient of color that can happen with a polarizer. In real life, there wasn't this much difference in the, in the hues and shades of blue in the sky. For that reason, uh, sometimes I take two exposures. I take one exposure for the foreground with the effect of the polarizer, taking the glare off the wet surfaces, leaves, rocks, what have you. Another image with the polarizer effect turned off so the sky isn't so, so weird looking. And then I blend it in Photoshop. But just be careful when you use a polarizer that you can't have, have this effect. And also remember that polarizers are dark. So it does have neutral density properties. It's very weak. It's about a stop and a half to two stops, but it does have some ND type of effect. And if, as, and if you engage the polarizer by, by turning it, you can actually increase the effect of that ND uh, or decrease it depending on which way you turn it. Another filter that uh, people talk about is the neutral night filter. And let me show you what that looks like. And I have it uh, over here somewhere. <laughs> let me see if I can find it. Uh, oh, here. This filter right here. It's right here. If you could, uh, this is sort of a bluish, purplish color, right? Uh, that's that's basically what it is. And what it does is, if you are shooting astro and you have a lot of light pollution, uh, particularly from the distant city or what have you, uh, this this filter filters out all of that light pollution. So image on the right, uh, this is a Mont Rainier uh, taken from um, Parrot no, Sunrise, taken from Sunrise. Uh, and then behind south of Mount Rainier, we had Portland and other smaller cities that's giving off a sort of greenish a light, a little yellowish light. So this is without the filter on the right. And once you put the skylight or this night filter, you get a much more neutral appearance on the left. Now, could I have achieved that post-processing wise? Probably. I can probably uh, control the white balance, change the tint, the, the warmth, and probably come up with something similar. But it's just more time you have to spend in front of uh, in front of your computer to achieve the effect by just putting a little uh, sort of a blue purplish filter in front of your lens to get this effect. So uh, take that as you will. You may you may want to have that in your repertoire, or you may say, well, you know, maybe I need that. That's up to you. Now here's a filter that most people have never even heard of, and it's called a central central graduated neutral density filter. You know those lenses, those very fast lenses you have, that 1.2, the 1.4, what have you, you shoot it very wide open, there's sort of a, a darkening at the periphery, the vignetting effect, if you will. Uh, and that's just the natural effect of a very, very wide aperture lens. No matter who makes it, many of these uh, lenses will have this peripheral darkening. Some people love that. Some people think that has that natural effect of drawing the eye into the center of the image, into the portrait, which is great. But if you don't like that effect and you don't want to get rid of it in post-processing, you could get a filter like this. It's called a central graduated. You can't, you can't tell, maybe you can, but at the very center, it's a little darker than at the periphery. So it's trying to balance out that exposure between the dark periphery and the lighter central area. Okay, so these are my recommendations if you're just starting out with ND filters or grad ND filters uh, or, or what have you. If you're a landscape photographer and you want to get into filters, 
I recommend it basically starting out two filters. Now I recommend the circular ones because I think um, they're a lot less cumbersome to carry around. Uh, it's a lot more portable and it's easier to put on the front of your lens without having to use adapters or what have you. A polarizer and a six stop. A six stop is just at the right amount that if you want that silky effect on the waterfall, whether you like that or not, you can. You want to get a little motion in the clouds, you can with the six stop. And remember, the polarizer has its own built in one or a half to two stops of ND. So if you stack those two filters, if you need to, I don't recommend stacking very much, but if in a pinch, if you have to stack it, you can get up to eight stop uh, of, of, of light reduction to get that effect that you want. So, right, so those are the two that I recommend, circular lens. Uh, if you're the budding portrait photographer and you have these fast lenses uh, and you want to take uh, these shallow depth of field images in very bright conditions, I think a three-stop ND is a great way to start out. That will tame most of the light, most situations where you would be able to shoot uh, with those parameters. And finally, if you're a videographer, I think it makes most sense to start out with a variable ND filter because you can adjust that uh, or that filter on the fly as you're going from scene to scene with the video and you want to maintain that uh, certain shutter speed based on how many frames per second you're shooting. Okay, so those are my main recommendations and uh, I'd like to take some questions at this point if it's, if it's possible and then we can discuss a little bit more about some other filters, um, some brands that are great uh, what are the difference between cheap and uh, expensive filters? Do we need a UV filter? All those steps we can talk about. I left a little bit more room on this talk uh, for a little discussion. Definitely. Definitely can get to questions for sure, Mahesh. Uh, thank you again for talking about this type filters, which, uh, you know, that last one, I had no clue about that. I didn't, never yeah. even heard of that. I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed of myself. That's it. I'm going to, I'm going to come back. They're going to be like, what do you, mean you never heard about this. That's it. Get out of here. No, most people have not heard about it. I mean, and it really in the modern world, I think it really doesn't have much of a use. Uh, it's only for the purest, like film photographers who, 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 who can't go and post process later on to take that little bit of vignetting out. I think for that, it has some limited uses, but just so you're aware that something like that exists. Sure. So, as a reminder, like Mahesh said, if you have any questions related to, it could be filters in particular, or any of the topics that we've covered over the course of the last three weeks uh, relative to you know lenses or any of that stuff, please feel free to drop them in, in the, either the comments section, or if you're joining us here on Zoom, you can use the Q&A tab and we'll get to them. So we'll start off, Hayden's joining us here on Zoom and wanted to find out Mahesh, do you find that there is a drop off of quality when you start to stack the quad filters? Yes, definitely, definitely, definitely. And even, so here's my motto or here's my philosophy for filters. I try to avoid filters like the plate, right? If I don't have to use filters, I don't use filters, whatever. But there's certain times where you have to use filters. You, if you want a, that prolonged effect, you know, if you need that shallow depth of field in bright conditions, you have to use a filter. I mean, it makes no sense to me. You buy a $2,000 lens, as we talked about this, Scott, and then you put like a $20 filter in front of that. There is an appreciable quality difference. Just not, not this one. Now, that's you stack two $20 filters, right? Now, the effect isn't linear. It's not one plus one equals two. It's one plus one equals five, right? It, the, 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 the degree of degradation of the image quality, particularly if you're using uh, high megapixel camera, anything more than 24, 36 megapixels, the more that's going to that's gonna show in your final image. So I try to avoid uh, stacking filters as much as I can. You know, every so often I do have to stack an ND filter and a grad ND filter, and that's about as much as I go. Uh, and, and, and I only really do it on the square or the rectangular type. I've, I've stopped stacking filters for the search field because now that they have the polarizer and ND built into a single filter, it's like a godsend because those are the two that I use the most and they're, and they're available in various strengths. So you can have a polarizer six stop combo, polarizer three stop combo, however you want it. So I really like that. And, and you kind of, you kind of, you know, address this sort of a little bit when, you know, we, we were talking about this before we, we went live to everybody out in, out in the, the world of, of WWWs. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so that's something interesting and, and something I think I agree with you on is obviously if you buy a $2,000 lens, don't put a $2 filter on it because that's probably not going to be 
but it, it's definitely not going to be really helping out your image quality at all. If anything, you're, you're, you're damaging what you're trying to achieve, but is there any kind of, we'll call it an algorithm or a, a cost, you know, benefit ratio, the, a point at which you say, you know, I spent this much on the lens and this is how much I'm going to allocate to, to a filter. Is there any kind of like equation on that or is it just really buy the best you can afford? Well, I, I unfortunately it's buy the best you can afford and, and, and here's why. And, and I'm not saying a particular brand because there's several brands out there, I think that are actually very, very good. Uh, you know, just, just to name a few, you know, you've got Missy filters, you've got great photography filters, you have Lee filters, Haida filters, LaCroix filters. These are all amazing, amazing. I've tried them all. And the only difference for me is their availability. Certain filters are more available for certain companies, whether they're based out of the US or based out of another country, or uh, it's, they're running out and do, they do a better job of advertising. But I have really tested out several of these uh, filters and I haven't noticed a big appreciable distance. So what I say is, you know, look at these, these four or five, six brands and see which one is on sale, you know, and, and see which one, uh, and, and remember, when, when you're buying these square filters or rectangle, you're buying into a system. So find one uh, that, that, that you get a good price on. But remember that if you do that, that's sort of what you're stuck with because there's some minor changes between filter brands that you may not be able to use the same adapter with another a company that you can with one company. And that's completely different for circular filters, right? Circular filters, you can mix and match however you want it because it's based on the diameter of your lens. So that's that's sort of the best answer I have for that. Sure, makes makes a ton of sense. Now, uh, long time long time listener, long time commenter, Matt Spinetta is joining us here on Facebook. What's going on, Matt? Uh, throwing this out there, wanted to know you're you're not a little late. We actually didn't talk about this, uh, but he wanted to know in in your opinion and the way you walk around when you're transporting your circular filters, uh, hiking, traveling, that kind of thing. How do you store them? Do you store them in the individual cases as they come when you purchase them or are you doing a, a wallet style? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And, you know, I struggled with that for a while for starting out. It's like, well, you know, so these cases are great. It's, it's padded. It's got felt lining. You know, it's super solid. It's, it's a plastic cover that's nice and hard. You'll never get, you know, but then each one is like this thick and this big, right? So this is what I use now. Uh, this is a no-name brand, a filter holder, uh, you know. And what I like about this is it actually has the most pockets in here that I found. Uh, it has one, two, three, four, five, six pockets and one in the front right here at the very end. That's so, I've said this before, my go-to lenses for landscape photography is a 16-35 f2.8 and a 24-105 f4. The 1635 takes 82 millimeter filters, the uh, 24 to 105 takes 77 millimeter filters. So I have a set of 82 millimeter filters here, right? And I have this step up ring that's 82 to 77. And it all fits nicely in this bag. It has a little place to put on my belt. Like once I take it out of my bag and I know I'm gonna be using it, I just strap it to the side of my belt and it's easy to use. And what's also great about this, which I haven't found in several other companies, is that the lining of this thing is actually felt. So as you slide the slider in and out, uh, you know, I've had this for two years now, and I haven't noticed a single scratch or anything on my circular filters. So this is, I think, the best way to go. Great. Now, Sydney wants to know, specifically addressing round polarizing filters, wants to know, how do you spin the ring on a round polarizing filter is there is there a certain level you know do you do you dial it in very slowly as you're working it around you know and then in terms of how easy it is to to get the effect in the most basically maximizing your effect when you're using that you know what's the best way to see that and make sure that you're actually getting everything that you you want out of it right that's a great question and the, the answer is actually very multifactorial because a lot of it depends a lot of it depends on what time of day you're shooting, what direction you're pointing your lens at or your polarizer at, you know? Uh, is it overcast? Is it not overcast? A lot of things actually, are you using an ultra wide angle lens or are you using a telephoto lens, right? Believe it or not, all of this figures into play. But the best answer to see what the effect is, is to look through your viewfinder or look through your lens and you adjust it. 
And, and many times you will adjust it and it happens to me all the time and nothing will happen. There'll be no change. That just means that uh, maybe it's towards the evening time, right? What a polarizer does is it looks at the incidence of light at various angles that's coming into the lens and it inhibits certain angles from happening, right? But that angle that comes in, even if you change your field of view just a little bit one way or the other, you're gonna have to adjust your polarizer because now you no longer have the same effect looking this way as you have looking this way. If you turn your camera portrait versus, or, uh, versus landscape, now you've completely negated the effect of the polarizer, then you have to go and readjust it again. So just look through your viewfinder, adjust the polarizer. And if you don't see much change, means that the polarizer is useless at that point, right? The, the light situation is such that the polarizer is having no effect. Now you just have another piece of glass in front of the lens that's going to degrade your image quality. If you have an ultra wide angle lens uh, and, and you're looking at the sky, that's the best place to look at to see if there's any effect happening at all. If you look at the sky, you use a polarizer, the clouds are becoming more intense. There's more shift of the color, like I mentioned in my talk, if you're there, then you know the polarizer is at its maximum uh, value. Now, there are certain manufacturers, there are certain manufacturers, for example, there's a company called Breakthrough Photography that actually on their polarizer, they have markings saying that, okay, this is the minimum effect, that's the maximum effect. But again, that is only true if you're looking at it at a certain angle in a certain direction. Once you change directions, those markings don't, don't mean anything. So I think it's a little bit misleading. Um, so there's no one single magic setting you can say, this is the maximum effect, this is the minimum effect. It really depends on the situation. Very cool. Now, Jim's asking a wonderful question. I think this is a question I think we both overlooked here. So you ready for it? Okay. <laughs> Jim, wants, Jim, Jim wants to know, what do you think about the clip and filters that go behind the lens and cover the sensor itself? What's your thoughts on those? Oh, you know, so I actually haven't used them, but in, in, in some sense, the, the back filters for the, the so this is a Sony 14 millimeter. You can use the same thing for the uh, 12 to 24. In effect, that's, that's what you're doing. You're, you're putting the filter at the very back of the lens element, and that's going up against the sensor. In, that's the closest I can get to personal experience for that. And I find these work amazingly, amazingly well. Uh, there's absolutely no light leak because everything is in a closed system. The only downside for me is that there's no polarizer, right? There's, there's, it's just ND filters. Uh, and if I want to use grad ND filters, then I'm out of luck. But I, then, then, then I just take multiple exposures at various exposure values and I'm forced to blend it in Photoshop. But far, as far as ND filter effect, I think it's amazing. Um, and I don't, I don't think it would be any different for on sensor versus uh, at back of the back of the lens. Wonderful. Now Ryan wants to know. Says, "Hey, I'm a newbie here. Welcome, Ryan." Yes. Hope you hope you hope you have a wonderful journey and hopefully we can help you through this journey. So congratulations. You're you're in the right direction. Um, in terms of filters, he bought some Tiffin variable density filters and he's seeing that they seem a little bit hazy even after giving it a nice thorough cleaning. Is that something that you notice is normal or is that something that maybe he should be concerned about? Yeah, it should not be hazy. Uh, so you probably don't have a great, great and uh, variable ND filter. The, the only artifacts that I, on a good quality and variable ND, only artifacts that I've really seen is the fact that you've got these cross type uh, uh, darkening or patchy areas of brightness and darkness, depending on how long the exposure times are. Uh, because like I said, it's basically two polarizers that you're stacking on top of each other and turning each one with respect to the other to get that maximum or whatever effect that you're trying to get. So as far as the haziness goes, uh, I, I, that, that should not happen with your variable ND filter. Excellent. So, you know, if, if, if you bought it from us at B&H and, and, and it wasn't too long ago, definitely hit up our customer service. Uh, if not, well, then come, come to our website and, and, and maybe get a new filter. We'll, we'll help you out with that too. We, we want to help. We, hopefully we can help some way. Uh, so, uh, Mahesh, what's, what, what, what's next? What, what's coming next? How can we, we keep up with you, find out more, what you're producing, all that stuff. Tell us about it. The best way is basically to follow me on Instagram. If you can, uh, it's starving photographer. 
Uh, I do update my website every so often with a uh, few blogs based on a lot of based on the webinars that I'm doing. Uh, I'm doing uh, tutorials, writing articles at various web places, but to keep up with the latest stuff of my misadventures, if you will, Instagram is probably the best way. And and what's what? what who are you on Instagram? Is it just my Hestapa on no, Instagram? It's starving photographer. Starving photographer. Starving yeah. photographer on Instagram. Check out his website, which I believe we dropped below at the beginning of this. This way you can read all of his wonderful blogs and keep up to date on what he's doing. And I know this isn't the last that we've seen of you. I know we're going to see you again soon, right? Yes, yes. Hopefully, at least in April, but maybe sooner. Maybe sooner. Hopefully we can get you in sooner and and catch up with you and and bring you guys at home some wonderful content. It's always a pleasure, Mahesh. We really appreciate you being here. Uh, anybody who didn't have an opportunity to see the past events, we also dropped those in the link as well. So if you missed part one or you missed part two, we threw those up as well. We've got the Vimeo links in there. So make sure to check that out. If you missed this event or any of our events for that matter, vimeo.com backslash BH event space. I almost, I almost forgot for a second. I almost, <laughs> I almost, I almost forgot my, my, my own uh, website over there. So it's been a long day. Check us out on Instagram as well. If you're not following along with us, that's how you can make sure you stay up to date with all the latest content that we're bringing you and what's coming ahead. So that's a BH event space on Instagram, but otherwise Mahesh, thanks again so much for being here. We really appreciate it. My pleasure, Scott. Thank you again. We'll see you soon. Definitely. And, uh, for everybody else, this has been another edition of the BH Virtual Event Space. We'll catch you next time.